everybody. We got a great one today, you know, for a change. And this time, it's not just a great one, but a different one. Finally, finally, something different. Because my guest is Trey Crowder, also known as the liberal redneck. Trey is a terrific comedian who grew up in Salina, Tennessee, a small town with no traffic lights, and and until the 90s had one big employer, Oshkosh Bagosh, makers of overalls. And in the 90s, the Oshkosh factory picked up and went to Mexico. The jobs left forever and the pills showed up for good at the exact (laughs) same time in like the mid mid to late 90s in Salina. And that combination just... That was it. It was curtains for that town. It's never recovered, you know, to this day. The pills are opioid pills like Oxycontin, which Trey's mom got hooked on and then did time for selling. And Salina went from a town that uh, went for gore in 2000 and is now a Trump stronghold. I say Trey is known as the liberal redneck because that's a character he plays online starting eight years ago, when his videos went viral on YouTube. Here's one from this week. A lot of people are coming after Cohen saying you can't trust him because he's an unscrupulous opportunist. Ah, yes, unlike all those paragons of virtue who normally testify in criminal conspiracy cases. Yeah, it's kind of par for the course, all right? When Fat Tony the Bull testifies against Don SpaghettiOs, it's understood you're not dealing with a PTA member, okay? To me, it's more important that their testimony can be corroborated by evidence and is in line with the cases presented. But hey, I didn't go to crime school. Yes, and as I record this introduction, it's Thursday afternoon, and the defense is doing its cross-examination of Michael Cohn, an unsavory character to be sure. But then again, look who he worked for. My guess is that the defense will not call the defendant to testify, even though Trump has been saying that he will. But of course, Trump testifying would be a perjury trap, starting with the oath to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Meanwhile, polls from the battleground states have not been good. Now, just like the House January 6th committee hearings didn't move the dial, I'm afraid that a conviction in the hush money trial may not redound to Biden's benefit. I I saw polling at the beginning of the trial that said a conviction could cost Trump seven points in the polling, which would be huge, huge. I just hope people haven't been paying attention and that Trump is, is convicted. Well, next week, I'll be going into the trial with Harry Littman, who has been attending the trial. Uh, But right now, let's get to my conversation with Trey Crowder, and I think you'll come away with a better understanding of why rural America has become Trump country. It's a great one, you know, for a change. You're known as the liberal redneck, and that's just one of your iterations, right? It's kind of weird, because that's, uh, I mean, yes, I for sure am, because what happened was, I was a stand-up comic. I was trying to do, I was doing comedy and trying to pursue that whole thing while living in Knoxville in the early 2010s. Mm-hmm. And then I went viral in 2016 with the video that I caught, you know, the liberal, uh, like a character. And it was more of a character at the time. It, now, basically, those videos are they're pretty much just me. But at the time, it was like <laughs> me really cranked up and I called it the liberal redneck. And it was just like a, you know, a thing I was trying, another thing I was attempting as a comedian, like a web series. Let's see what happens with this. And then that went viral and it became the thing I was known for. And so then, yeah, to, but now the, when I put them on the videos on YouTube, I still call them liberal redneck, but everywhere else I'm just, you know, listed as my name, just Trey. Well, when you do liberal redneck, you, it's different than some of your other stuff. And it's, it's, it is still a caricature of yourself yes. in a way. What I used to always say was it's just, it's a character in as much as it's me like cranked up a little bit. And, you know, early on in the very first videos, it was cranked up way more. Oh, you know okay. I mean? Like I, I cranked the accent up and everything. Yeah. Oh, um, okay. Gradually over the years, because I wanted to sort of like I didn't want people to only see me as just a liberal redneck, basically. So I sort of over the years it became more just me. But it comes from a very authentic place. I'm from a very you know stereotypically redneck background upbringing place in the world, and I am a liberal person <laughs> so it's all real it's just that like comedically i you know talk about a bunch of other stuff too in my podcast or on stage and whatnot it's i'm not just purely a political comic right generally right although i i, I watch your your stand-up special well let's go let's go talk about where you're from 
You're from Salina, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. Let's locate it for us. Salina is, it's like halfway between Nashville and Knoxville and then 40 miles north on the Kentucky line. So it's Tennessee's divided into East, Middle, and West Tennessee. Mm -hmm. It's Northeast, Middle Tennessee is where it is. Uh, So Salina had Oshkosh Bagosh as its Uh main employer, right? Is that right? Yes, for years and years, you know, like since way before I was born, it was like the the beating heart of the town's economy. You know, people either worked at the Oshkosh factory or they worked at the various businesses that like kind of supported and sold things to people that worked at the Oshkosh factory, basically. And then Oshkosh w- left. Yeah, in the 90s. In the 90s. Went to Mexico, the factory, or? Yes, yeah, I know that that became sort of uh, uh, cliche. You know, a misnomer or whatever over the year for a lot of places, like all the jobs went to Mexico and that's not what happened with all of them. But in the case of Oshkosh specifically, like, yeah, it literally went to Mexico in the 90s. And when Oshkosh left, the pills came in. That's when we talked the other day. That's what you said. Yeah, that's how I often put it, because it's true. I say that, like the jobs left forever and the pills showed up for good at the exact <laughs> same time in like the mid to you know mid to late nineties in Salina. And that combination just, that was it. It was curtains for that town. It's never recovered, you know, to this day. And it was personal for you, the pill part. You yeah. tell a story in one of your podcasts that I saw, it wasn't uh liberal redneck, but it was oh, putting on airs, putting yeah, on airs. Me, yeah. Cor- me and Corey Ron Forster, he's also a hillbilly from a small Southern town. We talk about fancy stuff, fancy people, culture, and fancy things, you know. Okay. On that, uh, you told about almost having to pay your own child support. <laughs> yeah. Tell that story. Cause it sort of yeah. says a lot about who you are. So, yeah, I'm also, I'm currently doing that on stage too, but I'll just, I'll just tell you the actual story instead of doing like a bit about it. That's so like, Oh, you can do a bit. If you want, my dad will, <laughs> or uh, I mean, it, weave in, honestly. weave in a, a, a yeah, feet or two well, of your bit. So my parents got divorced when I was seven, right? Which surprises no one. People are only ever surprised that they were married at all. You know what I mean? Uh, but they were, and they got divorced when I was seven. And uh, my mom, you said earlier, the pill thing was very personal for me. It was. My mom ended up getting very wrapped up up in that whole thing. You know, she ended up getting strung out on pills, but also she sold them and got caught put multiple times. Went to, was in and out of jail and was an addict. For most of my childhood. So my dad raised us. But when they first got divorced before any of that happened, like early 90s rural Tennessee parents get divorced. Like mom just kind of got custody of us kind of by default, Mm -hmm. basically. I mean, I was seven at the time. So but that's just how it always worked. Like it would be very rare then and there for a man to get sole custody of his kids. And that was the case. She got custody of us. But my dad was like, okay, but I mean, they're going to live with me though, you know, and the judge was just like, ain't you got a Camaro to work on or something? Just let her have it. You know? like, what are we doing here? From the very beginning, they split custody. And within just a couple of years, we lived with our dad full time, always, every day, every night. And when that happened, he stopped paying her child support because in his eye, you know, in his eyes, that was bullshit. It's like, she's never even here. They're with me all the time. Why would I pay her child support? But as it turns out, you know, that's bullshit. It's not a formally recognized legal defense for not paying child support. Right. Like he didn't he didn't do anything legally or with the courts to establish. He just stopped paying her because, you know, he's a redneck. Yeah. And he established custody. He didn't establish that with the courts either. No. Right. That just all happened. He just left the courts. It happened because it was the right thing to do, even though she got custody legally. Right. At first. Right. So it went on for years like that. And then eventually, and I don't know what took him so long, but eventually like the state of Tennessee came after him for it, for all this back child support. And my dad, we had no money. So, I mean, there wasn't anything. He didn't have it. And at the point they came after him, I don't know, it was like thousands of dollars. And he then did have to go to court. Me and my sister had, I don't get into all this in the stand up, but me and my (laughs) sister had to go to court and like give sworn statements as kids saying we live with him full time. We always have whatever. How old were you at this point? Probably like 12-ish. I, and my sister was like nine, 12 and nine. So maybe. it's like five years. You've been five years living with your dad. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I might have been a little bit older, but not much older than that. And again, I was a kid, so I don't remember exactly how it worked out. All I know is like, they, I guess they reached some kind of compromise with him, but it ended up being like, okay, well, here we can't just let you completely off with this for some reason. So they started saying, you got to pay like, I think it was like literally 10 or $15 a month, pretty much for like ever after that, you know, to pay it all back. 
that's what he started doing. And then he died when I was in my twenties. Right. And I hadn't thought about any of that in years. This is pancreatic cancer. I, I, he had pancreatic cancer, which was insane. I mean, from the time he found out and got diagnosed with it to the time he was gone, it was like two and a half months or something. I mean, it was wow. so fast. And I hadn't thought about any of that child support stuff in years, but then my dad dies and it's just me and my sister. And I got a call from the state of Tennessee one day and they were just like, yeah. So, you know, and I think there were letters and stuff too. It's like, you know, your father still owed the state of Tennessee. I feel like it was like $8,000 or something like that. And I was like, okay, well, (laughs) so what, you know? And they were like, what are we going to do about this? I was like, I don't don't know. (laughs) You tell me, you know? And then they were like, are there any assets you can liquidate? And I was like, asset, you know, what are you? I said, well, there's the house I grew up in where my Mima still currently lives at the time. My Mima, his mother was still living in that. That's house. your grandma. Yes. Yeah. My dad's mom. She has also since passed away, but at the time she was living there. It had been my dad's house. She moved in with him after her husband, my grandpa had died years before. Okay. So it was my dad's house, but she still was living in it. And I told him that, I said, well, there's that house. That's literally the only thing he owned or whatever. And the state of Tennessee person on the phone was like, well, that's perfect. That's great. <laughs> so here's what you could do. You could sell that house and, you know, you use the proceeds to pay us off. And then, you know, you can do whatever you want with the rest of it. <laughs> and I literally said on the phone, I knew what the this lump sum of money was for. I knew it was this back child support. And like at that moment, I said to her, I was like, so, you, so you're advising me that I need to sell the house my grandmother currently lives in (laughs) so I can pay y'all my own child support? (laughs) Is that what's happening here? Yes. And when I (laughs) said it like that, she was like, can we call you back? Right. And and I got a call a couple hours later from her, uh, her manager or whatever. And he was just like, he was like, yeah, you're right. Don't worry about that. We wiped all that out. We took care of it. Right. And uh, at this point in the bit, I've, done a thing earlier where I talked about how I don't feel like I'm white, I'm white trash. And then when this happens, I say, that's the first time in my life that I was like, damn, maybe I am white. <laughs> actually just, you know, they actually just let this go. But yeah, for a minute there, they try, because you can't be held accountable for like your parents' debts or whatever, unless it's debt to the state, apparently. And that's what makes it different. And the only way they can't like come after me and force me to pay it, but they can do what they tried to do. They can take like, you know, if there's property. any inheritance or whatever, yeah, property, whatever, they can they can take that first. But when you frame it the way you did, which is you want me to pay for my own child support. Right. That kind of crystallizes it enough that they had to go, yes. oh, okay. That's that's funny that you use it in your stand-up because it's so good. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I of course, it, yeah. but, but I mean, I, I was sampling your stuff and that's one I randomly hit on and it's yeah. a great story. So let's, let's go back to your mom. She was Oxycontin. That was her drug of choice, right? Yeah. I mean, any of those opioids right. like that, like anything she get her hand, you know, Oxys, Percocets, any of those things, but yeah. And she's sober now. Yes, she is sober now. She's, you know, been in recovery for a long time. The thing that I realized at, when I finally got older like for a long time, I had I had a real negative opinion of like drug addicts and whatnot. Like I was the type of person who was just like, just get it together. What's wrong with you? Mm-hmm. Like that was my, because I had this very personal connection to it. I realized years later, as I became an adult and I guess had my own kids and stuff, like I finally realized I had more empathy for her now because it's become clear. Like my mom also has like outside and around that she has like mental health issues too, like for sure. So she's thankfully sober, but she still got you know, she's got her things. (laughs) Well, probably being addicted that long and in that. Yeah, definitely. Changed the arc of her mental health. Right. I would think. Okay. So then you graduated from high school there and you went to Tennessee Tech. Which is uh, 40 miles down the road in Cookville, which still to me was like, you know, I used Cookville, Tennessee. It's a cow college in a town of like 20,000 people or something like that. But like I thought Cookville was like a legitimate city as a kid because of how small Salina is, you know. Right. Salina has what? What is it? What Or had what when you were 
the kid in terms the of the city itself is like around a thousand people. Mm-hmm. Uh, the whole county has maybe like six thousand or something like that spread out. We have no traffic lights in Salina right. or McDonald's or Walmart's or anything like that. I graduated high school with like sixty five people. That was the biggest class they'd ever had. Most classes at Salina are like you know forty ish students, maybe thirty five forty. So that's about how big it is. And you know you want to be a comedian at this point. Is that right? Mm -hmm. My dad had run the video store in Salina. It was a converted single wide trailer (laughs) called Crowder's Video. And it was like the video store in town. And I grew up in that. So like, and my dad was a big movie buff and all that type of thing. And so like, I had only ever really wanted to do show business stuff. And then from the time I was like 12, I always tell the stories at being 12 years old, because that was when me and my dad watched Bigger and Blacker Chris Rock special when it came out Mm -hmm. in 1998. And that was when it sort of crystallized into like, you know, that specifically, like that is the thing I want to try. And I was like kind of a funny kid at school. Other kids would tell me like, you should be a comedian or whatever. So they didn't, they didn't have those, those kind of uh, concert tapes or videos when I was a uh, kid. So I I got it from watching the tonight show with my dad and and from those comedians and buddy Hackett. Did you see like your dad laughing at stuff that was on the tonight show? Oh yeah. Yeah. My dad, yeah, right. My dad, uh, inhaled a pipe, uh, for his entire life until he died of lung cancer. And, um, you'll have that. Yeah. And he, uh, my, if, if buddy Hackett came on, for example, on the tonight Mm -hmm. show, my mom would get up and leave the room because my dad would always laugh and then start coughing and cough up phlegm. Right. And this is why I always, I always have a handkerchief in my right pocket, right front Mm -hmm. pocket, because my dad always did, but I don't have the phlegm problem that he quite had from, I don't smoke. Anyway, the point is we have similar, I think around the same age started thinking comedy. I've found that like a lot of comedy, a lot of male comedians, especially or comedy people, I've heard of a lot of similar stories about seeing their something made their dad laugh or whatever their dad could. And like specific bigger and blacker specifically is the special that has that whole bit about like Chris Rock goes in this whole thing. He's like, every song is about mama. Everybody talks about mama all the time. Nobody gives a shit about daddy. He's like, you know, what about that? And then he goes in that whole thing. It's like all daddy gets is the big piece of chicken. He's got this whole big chunk on like fathers yeah. who actually raise their children. And it's a uh, super hilarious. I mean, my dad was just like, I mean, just losing his mind throughout all of that. And, you know, I didn't think of it in that way at the time, but I definitely think that's part of why I was like, oh, hey, you know, I'd like to do that or whatever. Mm-hmm. But my dad was always, he he was always like, I can't do these anymore. But at the time, as a kid, he'd have friends over and he'd call me in the room and he'd be like, hey, do your Forrest Gump, boy, or do your Al Gore. <laughs> <laughs> like, just watch, sorry, you know, the Al Gore that you came up with, uh, the, uh, it was Daryl Hammond did it, but yes. Jim Downey, who's a great, Right. SNL writer, Legend. legendary yes. writer, not only wrote that, but taught Daryl the, the impression. Oh, yeah. I didn't know that part. But it was definitely, I was just trying to ape what Daryl Hammond was doing for sure. What's wild is like, now I know Al Gore. Like I ended up doing comedy at Al Gore's birthday party and like the corporate retreat he had and stuff. And so, but anyway, my dad was always like encouraging me to do funny stuff too. Like he thought I was funny even as a kid and his friends did too. So it was all part of that. So but I also was making straight A's. I was making really good grades. Nobody in my family had ever gone to college. So it was always like, you're going to go to college. And so I went to college and I went and got an MBA, but I had no interest in business or anything. The only reason I got that is because I thought it would give me the best chance of getting a like good paying job while I started comedy. You didn't want to wait tables. You didn't want to wait. I had no interest in that starving artist shit at all. Like, cause I had grown up poor and everything and I waited tables in college and I was like, I don't want to do that. So that's why I got an MBA. And then I got a job working for the U S department of energy. And then I Oak started. Ridge, was it? Yeah. Oak Ridge. Yeah. A lot of people don't even know. I, I didn't realize until I left Tennessee. A lot of people don't know anything about Oak Ridge. Well, it's one of know. the labs, right? Yeah, but it also like Oak Ridge was technically the headquarters and was one half of the Manhattan Project. They enriched all the uranium there that got sent to Los Alamos and put in the bombs and stuff, you know, but like in Oppenheimer and all that, it's always in the public consciousness. It thought that was all like Los Alamos. But in Tennessee, we knew all about Oak Ridge, but that was the forerunner to the DOE. And they just never left. They're still cleaning up nuclear (laughs) like spent material and stuff to this day. 
Uh, but they also do a bunch of other things. They have Oak Ridge National Laboratory, like there's a particle accelerator, world's fastest supercomputer, all this crazy stuff there in Oak Ridge. And yeah. And that's what you ran that you, you developed this, the supercomputer, right? <laughs> yeah. The, yeah. The supercomputer. I was that guy. I was in charge of that. I mean, your master's in, uh, in business. Business. Yeah. That's, it's funny. Cause people in Salina, like that's what, when I would come back to my hometown or whatever, they'd be like, they got you in charge of the nukes train. Like, they literally <laughs> meant it. You know, they thought that, but I was, a, you know, I was a desk jock. I was doing contracts, government contracts. And like mostly for most of my time there, janitorial and IT contracts and that type of stuff, you know, not and nothing crazy. So, so did you meet your wife there? Met her in Cookville when I was at uh, Tennessee tech and I worked oh. at, I said, I waited tables. One of the places I worked at was a Cajun, place called crawl daddies i think it's the best restaurant in cookville and i thought that at the time too but i worked there and she also worked there and that's how we met now if they put best restaurant in cookville trey crowder uh in the yeah. window would that mean anything i don't know it could could drive some people away <laughs> you know what i mean <laughs> like I'm, I'm a polarizing figure and i don't uh, cookville i don't know but like in salina for sure like i'm not not really a hometown hero because of the nature of what I do. A lot of people see me as a blood trader, but you know, what are you going to do? Blood trader. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no. So, uh, that might drive business away. I see. <laughs> yeah. Possibly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, some, and the other business they probably already had. So it's right. a small town, right? Yeah. By any, by any real metric, Cookville is also a small town. That's where you met your wife. Yes. At that restaurant. Yeah. That you're, yes. you know, and now th this is me making too much of this. Uh, I've heard you reference it a couple times, I think, which is that uh, somebody was sick or something. And one of the uh, other waitresses said something like, I'll pray for you. And your wife said something else. Yeah, it actually was a, another waitress had gotten a DUI. You know, she got in like some trouble with the law. And oh, this okay. other we were all at the restaurant and this other server heard that and goes, oh, man. Well, I'm going to pray for her. And, and my wife goes, that's crazy. I, too, am going to do nothing at all to actually help. Uh, <laughs> and was that a moment where you went, yeah, that's her, because that's my I wife. had never, I'd never really even thought about it until I met her and until like that and everything. But literally every girl I'd ever dated up until that point was like your stereotypical, like small town Christian conservative girl, like very churchy, very conservative. Like one of my ex-girlfriends now is like, I don't know if she still was, but on Facebook for a while, she was like actively campaigning for Parler. You remember Parler, like the the right wing social media okay, thing right. that they tried to make it. Yeah, right. She was like she was on Facebook trying to get people to sign up for Parler and stuff like she's like hardcore MAGA and everything. And they had all been like that. When I met her, I real she was the first girl I'd ever met around there or dated that was like me and that she was a religious, wasn't down with church and the Lord and all that. And she liked gay people and stuff. And, you that know. sort of begs the question, what percentage of the South and of uh, Tennessee and of those states, uh, those states, do liberals represent? Is it 10 percent, 20 percent? Well, I mean, I think when you say do liberals represent that question, I think generally, you know, you look at the electoral maps and whatnot and it's, you know, high 30s, 40s, 46, 47 percent blue usually. Mm -hmm. So that's, there's that many Democrats or whatever in, in each of the southern states that just are outnumbered. But there's that's still millions of people. But when it, you, you know, narrow it to liberal rednecks, that changes things because obviously a huge number of that people is the black population in the south and things like that. And that's the other thing, too, is a lot of the Democrats in the south are people from and who live in the cities. Right. Right. And they probably would not self-identify as being rednecks, I would imagine, or they don't think of themselves as rednecky. Most of them don't have an accent. No, if you're in Nashville, if you're in Nashville, I, right. I did uh, the City Winery in Nashville recently, yeah. did, did a few shows. And my audience, you know, I would not say we're, we're rednecks. Redneck. No. Right. No. So, right. So when you limit it to that, <laughs> what I mean, you know, it's a pretty small percentage. I'm not going to lie. Like, I, we're not unicorns like... My sister is like me. Most of my good friends from Salina that I'm still friends with to this day, which so we're talking like five dudes, but they're all also like me and they seem pretty rednecky. So it, I'm not an actual unicorn, but it's there. It's not a hu huge number of people for sure. I, I don't even know what the percentage would be like in a town like mine. 
where most people are kind of redneck. I mean, what percentage are like liberal at all? I mean, yeah, I'm t- 10, maybe 10 to 15, but I'm pulling that straight out of thin air. I don't actually know, but not a lot. I, w- I want to get to so many things uh, for your career. I also want to, your uncle uh, was mm. gay and that was yes. something that he was very accepted by ob- his family. Yes. Uncle Tim. Uh, yeah. I mean, see, he, like, for example, on your last question, Uncle Tim was the president of the Clay County Democratic Party for a long time. And it was like him and three women <laughs> at their <laughs> meetings and stuff. But yeah, my Uncle Tim was gay. I, I knew that ever since I knew what being gay even was. Like when my parents like sat me down to explain, you know, sexuality, like bird and the bees talk or whatever, like from that moment. I knew Uncle Tim was gay. And so I was like nine or 10. I didn't think I was like, okay, whatever. I didn't know that was weird or anything at all to it to anybody. I mean, or that anybody had a problem with that. I loved Uncle Tim. I still love Uncle Tim. He's still kicking. He's great. He's hilarious. But after I found that out, after I understood what all that meant, then I started noticing like things that I had wouldn't have noticed before, like the homophobia and shit like that, that you see in churches or around places like Salina. So the first thing I was ever openly, I guess, progressive about was LGBT stuff because of my gay uncle. But I didn't think of that as being a political thing. I was just like standing up for my uncle. You you know what I mean? Yeah, of course. That was kind of the gateway thing, I guess. That's kind of what I've always said. In retrospect, I think about like my grandma, his mom, she just died recently and actually talked about it at her funeral a little bit. Like I also didn't have a frame of reference to really appreciate how cool it was of like my grandma and my grandpa and everything they accepted my uncle still that him and his partner my uncle mike who they're not together anymore but they were together for like 30 years they were at every christmas every holiday it was like they didn't ostracize him or kick him out or anything and you can't take that for granted and yep. you know places like like to this day gay kids get put out on the street by their christian parents or like that stuff still happens all the time and so That was definitely a big factor uh, that, you know, my family didn't do that to Uncle Tim and wouldn't have done that. Let's let's talk about your career. You decided to do a a video. What, your second one hit? Yeah, I started stand up in 2010. Where were you doing stand up then? I'm sorry to interrupt, but where did you do stand up? I started at Side Splitters Comedy Club in Knoxville, Tennessee, which has since closed down. But like in places like that, you go, I'd go to Chattanooga, to the Comedy Catch, or to Zanies in Nashville. That's where you did your special with Zanies, right? Yes. Yeah. I consider Zanies like my home club now because mm-hmm. that's, you know, I'm from, from Middle Tennessee and whatnot. But I started in Knoxville, though. And a lot of bar shows, a lot of breweries, those types of shows were kind of just starting to happen a lot whenever I started, at least in areas like that. And so by 2016, I was like featuring in comedy clubs and headlining like bar shows and things like that. I was pretty, you know, well established in like the South at my level. So, you know, the bar show level. And I was doing a lot of comedy festivals. I had come to L.A. and did some shows. I got a manager in L.A. I got into this NBC talent development program for writing, late night writing, actually. I'd submitted a packet and got into the NBC late night writers workshop and went to 30 rock for a while. Now, when you went to 30 rock, there is a late night show at 30 rock. Yeah, no, we went to, we like toured the SNL studios and the tonight show set and the late show set and all that stuff. And like took classes and lessons from writers and not, you know, it was like a, like a week long intensive thing at 30 rock, all about NBC's like late night slate, you know, SNL and the tonight show and all that. It was, I mean, it was super cool. Like it was, Great. And that, so like at that NBC thing, I was the only comic who didn't live in New York or L.A. And I was from Knoxville, you know, so like especially considering I was in Knoxville, I was feeling good about the whole thing. I thought it was going well. I still had my day job and all that. And at the time, I had this bit that I would do and stand up. And the premise, the way I would set it up was like anytime anyone hears my accent, they always think, you know, you're a Bible thumping troglodyte or a dipshit or whatever. And it's because of the, that's the only thing you ever see in the media or on the news. Like it's, that's all you ever see is somebody, if somebody sounds like me, they're going to say some crazy dumb stuff every time. So I was like, so what I'm going to, I'm going to try to combat this, you know, I'm going to start going out in public and being just as loud and just as crazy and just as redneck, but I'm going to say a lot of like smart progressive stuff to try to balance the scales. You know, that's how I would set it up. And then I would just start yelling progressive things but in a very redneck sort of fat you know what i mean like my 
my F-150 has got a bumper sticker on it that says my other truck's a Prius, you know, like that type of thing. Like <laughs> okay. in stand up. And it always did really well, even in like Southern clubs and stuff. At the time I would tell my friends, I would be like, you know, that bit I do that about being like a liberal redneck or whatever. It's like, I was, I've been thinking about making like a web series around that idea or something. And every one of them, every time would be like, that's a great idea. You should totally do that. Right? <laughs> and I was like, but I, in my head, I was like, I don't, that's funny. I don't know how to edit. I don't have a good camera. I need all this stuff. It felt like a barrier to entry, which did not actually exist. And then in 2016, I saw this video that was going viral on the right. Like, so people I went to high school with and stuff were sharing it on Facebook, had like 30 million views. It was this preacher in North Carolina, like a young preacher, kind of looked like me, like white Southern guy, dark hair, all this stuff. And he's standing out in the woods, holding his phone, screaming about the transgender bathroom thing in North Carolina. Yeah. Not a dick joke in sight, nothing funny about it. Just like preaching fire and brimstone about the evils of these freaks in the bathrooms with our little girls or whatever. That's what he was doing. And it had like 30 million views and all this stuff. And it was like a light bulb moment for me. I realized I was like, if, th if this dude and this thing is what I'm trying to make fun of, then I don't need any kind of fancy setup or camera. In fact, that would be a mistake. Like that would be dumb for me to do that. What I should do is I should just do exactly what he does. I should just go out in the woods or in my truck or whatever and just yell in my phone, you know? And when I realized that, then I made the first one a couple of days later. The first one was actually about Tennessee considering making the Holy Bible, the official state book mm -hmm. of Tennessee. Mm -hmm. And the whole, the premise, the, the angle in that one was just like, oh, now y'all give a shit about books, huh? You know how often I got called gay for liking books as a kid? Like, you know, that was, and it got like 70,000 views on Facebook or something, which I was over the moon about. Sure. I was thrilled. So I was like, okay, so, all right, I guess I'm onto something. I'll keep going. The second one I made was about the transgender bathroom law. And that one went to the moon. It went like crazy viral, like, you know, tens of millions of views. And I got, you know, suddenly I could tour, I could sell tickets. I got a development deal with Warner Brothers. I got, got a book deal. Like all this stuff happened like literally overnight. And then I shortly after that quit my day job and went full time into, into comedy. And that was eight years ago. So I've been doing it ever since, you know, and I've sold a number of pilots and, you know, trying to get them off the ground. Let me ask you about that. Uh, yeah. I imagine when you got your deal, was it, let's do liberal redneck. Pretty much. And yeah. was you as a character, I read something about it or heard it somewhere that the first one was set like at a place like Oak Ridge. Yeah. The first one, we really tried to make that a big part of it. Like, you know, my character worked at a fictionalized Oak Ridge National Laboratory and there was all these like, there's redneck characters and brilliant scientist characters in the same place and all this. But we also tried to do some of the sort of like liberal rednecky stuff that people knew me for or whatever. And it just got, it was kind of too convoluted. It was like, it wasn't clear what it was actually about. Now, did you write that with other people who were more experienced yeah. in Hollywood? Yeah, Warner Brothers, you know, they set a lot of meetings for me with experienced writers. And it's like, okay, you know, and figure out who you're going to do this with. Did you shoot a pilot on that? No, I haven't shot any of them. You haven't shot any of them? No. Sold four, wrote the scripts, turned them in, didn't get any of them shot. One of them, I feel like it came down to the wire, it came very close. It was with ABC and I, they don't tell you a reason, but I fully believe the reason that one didn't get shot is because that was the year they decided to reboot Roseanne. Right. Right. <laughs> and it was like, you know, two working class things at the same time or whatever. He couldn't do that, but who knows? That's silly. But yeah. But yeah, they, I had all these meetings with writers. I ended up doing the first two with John N Who's the guy that created party down longtime comedy writer. I love party down's a great show. And the producer was Rob Thomas, who's produced all kinds of stuff. It's been around forever, but he created Veronica Mars and, I zombie and whatnot. He's from Texas. And how many pilot scripts have you written? I mean, I've written a bunch. I sold four pilots, three of which were kind of like, you know, a version of the Trey Crowder show or whatever. And then the fourth one was a totally different thing that I got. I, I mentioned earlier, I did stand up at Al Gore's birthday party. Mm -hmm. At that, I met T Bone Burnett and Callie Corey. Oh, Callie God. Corey wrote that. Yeah. Yeah. I know yeah. them. Yeah. Love. They're, they're like, I mean, I love them now. They're like good friends of mine at this point, but I met them there. T-Bone had an idea for a show at the time. And he was like, you want to help us with this? And I was like, of course. 
And so we put this show together with them that had nothing to do with me, but I did help them conceive of it all and write it all and everything. And we sold that to Amazon. That one I feel like was a victim of the pandemic is what happened there, if you ask me. But I've also, I've written like... Warner Brothers paid me to write a spec script and then I've written other things on spec and pilots just because I want to. I just finished a feature script that I'm about to try to get read and see what happens. So, I mean, I've written a bunch of things, but I've sold four. I, I had an idea that I ran by T-Bone, which was Mozart's son and Salieri's son form a band. Yeah. And Mozart's son is really brilliant and invents rock and roll. And right. uh, Salieri's son is the, the guy whose dad buys the amps, except there are no amps. <laughs> but I mean, and has no talent at all. <laughs> right. And, yeah. uh, but I know what it is to write things and not get them done. That's the other thing too, is like people don't really, like people in my hometown, you know, I would sell a pilot and that would get in deadline or something, which would then be on, you know, the internet. And deadline just says ABC buys Trey Crowder sitcom or whatever, like that type of thing. Well, people in my hometown think that means like you're on TV. When is it yeah, coming right. on Wednesday? You know, like, and I've had to explain to so many people so many times. It's like, that's not actually how it works. And the vast majority of the things they buy don't actually make it on the air, you know, whatever. So, um, have you seen, uh, the time magazine where they interview Trump? No, I mean, I knew that it happened, but I haven't read it yet. So let me run some of these by you. This is uh, Heather Cox Richardson's sort of summary of the author. Eric uh, Cortalesa was a, a guy from Time Magazine, and this is sort of what he writes, too. Uh, Trump plans to use the military to round up, put in camps, and deport more than 11 million people. He is willing to permit Republican-dominated states to monitor pregnancies and prosecute people who violate abortion bans. That sounds pretty Orwellian, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I know. And the craziest part is, you know, that like his people are hearing this like, hell yeah, brother. <laughs> I know. Well, that's why he, he kind of says this. Playing the hits. <laughs> yeah. And he has stuff that's completely, uh, you know, gut the U.S. civil service, deploy the National Guard to American cities as he sees fit, close the White House pandemic preparedness office. That's a very yeah. weird thing for him to do, considering how ill-prepared we were and how he kept being ill-prepared. Yeah, I imagine he just sees it as a total win on his part or does, he refuses to acknowledge any kind of, you know, wrongdoing when it comes to that. And so it's like closing that, it's his way of saying, like, yeah, you don't need that. We never needed that. I was right the whole time. You don't need something like that. You there know? you so go. Anything that has to do with Biden, like get rid of it. <laughs> yeah, you just still let down. I mean, Obama had it too, and they got rid of it when he came in. Right. And yeah, that's, that's good thinking. I mean, do you get asked this all the time? What are actual real rednecks? They're Trumpies, right? I mean, yeah, now they are. And it's so weird to me. I mean, basically in 2016, because of everything I, we already talked about with Salina and the story of Salina and the, the factory leaving while the Clintons were in office and all this stuff prior to that, for most years, Salina was actually like a working collar blue county, like Southern Democrat camp, but like well into the 80s and 90s, like it went for Al Gore and, and all this. And then um, and now it's hardcore Trump country. And in 2016, I was saying like. You know, when he says to people like this, like I'm going to, you know, bring, I'm going to go to Mexico and get make them pay and bring your jobs back and all this stuff he was saying, it's like, you know, he's saying exactly what they want to hear. And I understand why they want to believe that stuff. It's just even then at the time I was like, but I don't get why they do believe it coming from this guy. Like I, he's so clearly incapable of delivering on any of those promises. And also he hates, he's hates and is disgusted by these people and he's completely full of shit. So I don't know why they are on board with it, but I do get why they want to believe it. Right. That's what I said in 2016. But after everything that's happened since then, I, I at this point, I just feel like they're too dug in. They're too committed. It's too much about like owning the libs and, you know, it's like sports and pro wrestling all wrapped up in one. It's their team and they want their team to win. And it's just all gotten super mm -hmm. muddied and everything else. But I was saying at the time, like I went on Bill Maher show the first time the Friday after the 2016 election, it was wild, it was surreal. And mm. I said to him on there at the time that I, I don't remember how exactly I got into it, but I said that like, 
I knew for a fact that if you had polled every stereotypical redneck before Donald Trump got into politics, when he was just the like, you know, rich guy douchebag on TV and in The Apprentice and stuff, if you had polled any redneck man back then about their opinion on Donald Trump, it would have universally been like, oh, he's a blue blood, silver spoon Yankee who thinks he's smarter than everybody else and needs his ass whipped and thinks he's better than everybody else and that type of thing, right? He was the exact picture of like, exactly the type of person they can't stand before he got into politics. But then he went after Obama and then he just started, you know, playing directly to them in every way. And they just totally went for it. And I don't know if it's, that's how desperate they were. You say after, when you say after Obama, did rednecks not like Obama because he was black or did they? I mean, I, you know, I don't know how else to explain it. It's like I said, Clay County was a blue County for most years, but not 2008. You know, I don't know what else that's about. I mean, they they would act like that wasn't why, of course, surely. That's the other thing that's wild is like used to even like the redneckiest dudes I know would have told you that they're not racist or whatever, even though like they were. And now I don't that feels less true. Now it's like they're more out and proud about that type of thing ever since ever since post Trump, you know, and it's just it's all wild to me. People start saying it out loud. But yeah, I, I feel like not every Trump voter is racist, but every racist is a Trump voter. Yeah. That's exactly how I feel about it too, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Now what what's next? You're touring or are you uh... Yeah. Always always touring. Go to TreyCrowder.com, T R A E Crowder dot com to check out my dates. I've got I'm hoping to film the hour I'm doing right now. I'm hoping to film that at some point this year, trying to figure out the logistics and put that out how, wherever it ends up going. And then, uh, like I said, I'm always writing about to take another sitcom out and try to sell it. I've just wrote a feature script. I'm, you know, still keeping the plate spinning, keep pushing that boulder. That's how I put it, pushing the boulder. But yeah, you know, keep, keep going and keep making the videos. That uh, Mozart Salieri son thing. Yeah, that, that'd make a great sitcom. <laughs> yeah, for me, yes, it'd be a great that'd be pilot perfect. For me, for Mozart's son. Yes, <laughs> and also, I just want to say, just so you know, like as somebody with that background who's a longtime fan of comedy, and and I grew up watching SNL and all that. Like, I'm a huge fan, also politically too, and uh, so I really appreciate you having me on. It, I think it's very cool because you're also kind of a legend, so I appreciate it. Oh, Jesus Christ! Well, that's I might as well end on that. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I, I hope you enjoyed uh, listening. That beautiful music is by Leo Kotke, the great Leo Kotke. I want to thank Peter Ogburn for producing this podcast. We'll talk again next week. Mm-hmm.